you're about to take a deep dive into one of the biggest true crime cases in the universe, or at least on our part of the planet. From the Hidden Killers podcast and True Crime Today. All right, everybody, welcome back. It's time for another deep dive. And, you know, we always got to dig deep and get into the stories behind the music. And this one, this one's a real head scratcher, let me tell you. We're going back to 1994. Bad Boy Records is brand spanking new on the scene. Hmm. And boom, they drop Flaba in Yaya. Massive. Huge hit, right. But the guy behind it, Craig Mack, kind of fell off the radar after that. So... We got to ask, what happened? Was he a one-hit wonder or was there something else going on behind the scenes? Stick with us. We're about to break it all down. Let's do it. All right. So for those who weren't around back in the day or maybe just need a little refresher, let's take a listen to Flaba in Yai after music. See, I told you that beat still slaps. Even after all these years, this was like the anthem of 94 put Bad Boy Records on the map. You really can't talk about 90s hip hop without mentioning this track. It's true. Flava in Yai ear was everywhere that year. And you know, it wasn't just the beat, it was the whole package. Bad Boy, even though they were just starting out, they had this polished sound, these slick music videos. They were selling a lifestyle, an aspiration. And for a minute, Craig Mack, he was the face of it all. Which makes his like disappearance from the scene even more baffling, right? I mean, the guy had the talent, the looks, the hit song, what went wrong. One thing we got to consider, and our sources mention this, is Puff Daddy, or P. Diddy as he's known now. Even back then, he had a reputation for being, how should we say this, a very involved manager. Oh, yeah. He had his hands in everything. But to be fair, the music industry back then, especially hip-hop, it was a whole different beast. You had to fight for your spot, be ruthless almost. Diddy was building an empire, and, well, let's just say he had his ways of doing things. Oh, we're going to get into all that, trust me. There were stories about contracts, artists feeling stifled creatively. Makes you wonder if maybe those whispers, those rumblings, started way back with Craig Mack. Well, remember, this was also a time when hip-hop was rapidly changing, evolving. You had the East Coast, West Coast rivalry heating up, new sounds emerging every day. To stay on top, to stay relevant, Diddy had to make some big moves, some strategic decisions. And that's where Biggie comes in, right? Talk about changing the game. But we'll save that part of the story for after this quick break. Don't go anywhere. All right, so we left off talking about Biggie coming onto the scene at Bad Boy. Yeah, talk about a game changer. I mean, Biggie wasn't just some rapper, you know? He was a force of nature. Oh, absolutely. When Ready to Die dropped same year as Max debut, it was like everything shifted. The whole landscape of hip-hop changed, for sure. But what was it about Biggie specifically that you think really resonated with Diddy's vision for Bad Boy? Because from everything we've gathered, Diddy was a businessman, first and foremost, always looking for that next big thing, that next trend. You hit the nail on the head. He was all about staying ahead. Mm -hmm. And Biggie, he had this... I don't know, this raw authenticity, this lyrical depth. Oh, yeah. It wasn't just party anthems, you know, although he had those too. Right. But he could be gritty, introspective, even funny. It was like a window into a world that most people had never seen before. And that rawness, that realness, you're saying that's what Diddy tapped into. He saw the potential for Biggie to connect with audiences on a whole other level. Exactly. But did that mean pushing Mac aside? It's a classic dilemma, isn't it? The music biz, I mean. Do you play it safe, stick with what's working, or do you go all in on something new, something bigger, even if it means, you know... Making tough choices. Exactly. Tough choices. And let's be real, Diddy was not known for shying away from a little, shall we say, a little tough decision making. No, not at all. One of our sources even used the word ruthless when describing his business style. There were definitely stories. Stories about contracts, about creative differences. I mean, it wasn't exactly a secret how things went down at Bad Boy sometimes. Right. And it makes you wonder if some of that, you know, those whispers about how Diddy operated, if maybe they started way back with Craig Mack. It's entirely possible, isn't it? So we've got this pattern emerging. Mack's early success. Biggie bursts onto the scene and Diddy right there in the background pulling the strings. But the big question is, was it deliberate? Did he intentionally sabotage Mack's career? Or was it just, you know... A case of bad timing, wrong place, wrong time. Exactly. It's the million-dollar question. And unfortunately, we'll never know for sure what went down behind closed doors. Right. But here's something else to consider. We came across multiple sources, 
multiple artists who had similar experiences with Diddy's management style. Oh, man. Are we about to get into the Mace and the Lock saga? Oh. Because that's a whole other deep dive right there. It's a rabbit hole, that's for sure. <laughs> it really is. But we'll unpack all of that after a quick break. Stay with us. I mean, think about it. You have Mass right at the peak of his career, and he just walks away from it all. The Locks, they were fighting tooth and nail to get out of their deal with Diddy and Faith Evans. Even Faith, who was practically family, being married to Biggie, even she talked about the difficulties she faced at Bad Boy. And that's what makes this so important. This wasn't just about one artist or one particular style of music. This was about the power dynamics in the music industry. Yeah. You know, and how someone like Diddy, with his business smarts, no one can deny that. And, you know, maybe a little bit of that ruthlessness could really shape an artist's entire career for better or worse. It's kind of sad when you think about it. Craig Mack comes out hot with Flava and Yair and then just kind of fades away. He passed away in 2018, which makes this whole conversation kind of bittersweet. It really does. It makes you think, what if? What if Craig Mack had been signed to a different label? Or what if he'd come up in a different era in hip hop? Would we be talking about him like we talk about Big E as a legend? It's impossible to say for sure. Man, that what if will keep you up at night. Yeah. That makes you wonder how many other Craig Macks are out there. You know, artists with loads of talent who just for whatever reason don't quite make it to the top or get lost in the shuffle. Absolutely. Yeah. The music industry, it's easy to get caught up in the excitement, the lights, the glamour. But the reality is it could be brutal. There's talent everywhere. It but it you. takes more than just talent. It takes luck, good timing. And yeah, let's be honest. A whole lot of navigating these power dynamics. So we started this deep dive with a mystery one-hit wonder or something more. I don't think we're going to find any easy answers here. But I got to say, after digging into all this, I'm hearing Craig Mack's music in a whole new way. And that's how it should be, Flava and Yair. It's more than just a song. It's a snapshot of a very specific moment in hip-hop history. Mm -hmm. But it also represents this bigger story that's still playing out today, this constant tension between art and commerce, between staying true to yourself and the pressures of the industry. And of course, all those what ifs that we're still thinking about all these years later. That's deep, man. And you know, that's what I love about these deep dives. We go beyond the surface level, get into those stories that don't always get told. And sometimes we end up with more questions than answers. But hey, a little mystery never hurt anyone, right? Thanks for joining us for another deep dive. We'll catch you next time. In a world where the darkest secrets lie just beneath the surface. Well, they said it was an accident, but the evidence says otherwise. Where hidden killers roam unnoticed in the shadows. Well, I think you would definitely be looking at a, a blend of toxic, very bad narcissistic personality traits, and they will be vengeful and possibly resort to violence. Join Tony Bruschi as he uncovers the truth behind the most chilling cases. They said it was an accident, but the evidence clearly says otherwise. Each episode, we dig deep into the minds of those who commit the unthinkable. To your point of narcissism, he thinks in his own mind how witty he is, yeah. but he lost that jury. I, I was I was done with him in two minutes. From unsolved mysteries to infamous crimes. Geez, you've just talked about how you've taught yourself how to do everything under the sun. I bet you did a YouTube video, how to best kill somebody with a knife. Hidden Killers with Tony Bruschi takes you where few dare to go. How does someone with such a dark secret go unnoticed? For so long. With multiple new episodes every single day. We're not just telling stories, we're seeking justice. Listen now on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for Hidden Killers with Tony Bruschi.